Okay, so you've heard him in question format. Now you get to see him in presentation mode. So, Wynne, do you want to uh, share your screen? All right. Okay, so yes, no, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Wynne uh, remotely um, from night to day, shedding light on vortex behavior in the day diagram. So, yeah, over to you, Wynne. All right, thanks, Rich. Excuse me. So first of all, I should uh, like to apologize for not being there in person. And uh, of course, my gratitude to Rich and the Magnets team for making it possible to participate online. Uh, this is a presentation I gave at AGU a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a very simple story, really. Uh, but nevertheless, resulted in at least one senior academic in the AGU session kind of uh, frothing at the mouth. Uh, a scientist, I, I must say, I, I very much respect. Uh, but in any case, uh, I would be interested then in your feedback today. But I would suggest maybe that uh, the senior academics in the audience have a glass of water and some maybe some beta blockers at the ready, uh, you know, better safe than sorry. So this is pretty much verbatim what I gave it at you. Uh, it's a little short in time and hopefully leave some room for discussion. I'm going to present uh, some numerical predictions of how we expect single vortex domain states to appear in the day plot, and then to speculate as to whether the day plot is still a useful tool to help us uh, discriminate reliable paleomagnetic recorders. Uh, data in uh, 1977 suggested that the plot of the hysteresis parameters of saturation remnants against the ratio of coercivity of remnants to coercivity could be used as a domain state indicator for titanomagnetites. And it's in fact then been extensively used since that time as an indicator of whether or not a paleomagnetic sample contains reliable remnants carriers. And that's really what we want to know. One of the often noted problems of the day diagram is that the vast that, that the vast majority of the samples plot within the region colored yellow uh, here in the center of the plot for pseudo single domain grains, and so don't appear to discriminate different types of samples or between reliable or unreliable magnetic recorders. So on uh, this plot, I've uh, put a range of natural samples from a data set collected by Andrew Roberts for sedimentary and igneous samples, which are colored blue and red, respectively. And another collected data set from Greg Patterson, who's in the audience there, of igneous and archaeological samples shown in purple and orange, respectively. Almost all these samples plot within this PSD yellow region bounded by the coercivity remnants and coercivity ratios of between 1.5 and 4, and the saturation remnants values between uh, 0.05 and 0.5. Very few of these samples appear in the SD uh, region um, shown in green in the upper left. Uh, so uh, in this PSD region, uh, of course, then this suggests that it excludes all single domain grains of any mineralogy, since uh, all single domain grains must have a saturation remnants of less than 0.5. So this uh, lower bound for the saturation remnants of a 0 0.5, of course, is easily demonstrated from simple analytic calculation. And the fact that our samples are vast, uh, have a, a value of uh, saturation remnants less than 0.5 suggests that hardly any of our samples contain single domain grains. We can determine the expected value of the saturation remnants from a simple analytic calculation outlined in David Dunlop's, uh, David Dunlop's book. And I've done that on, on this slide for a variety of anisotropies um, of decreasing symmetry from the top to the bottom of this table. And we can see that the grains with the higher degrees of symmetry of anisotropy, either shape or crystalline, have higher values of saturation remnants. What this means then is that since the lowest symmetry you can have uh, is uniaxial, then the lowest value of saturation remnants, MRS, that you can have for single domain grains will be 0 0.5. 
And then what that should imply is that MRS by itself is a good indicator of the main state for non-interacting grains. So if we go back to our day plot of natural samples, it's somewhat surprising that the single domain grains, which we often think of as being the most stable and reliable magnetic recorders, appear to be quite rare in our paleomagnetic samples, with very few of them plotting in that upper green region. We might then also wonder why PSD grains appear to be so dominant in the day diagram. At the time that uh, Dave Fuller and Schmidt uh, published their paper in 1977, of course, the origin and the structure of pseudo single domain grains was not well understood. But uh, for over 30 years now, the magnetic models have clearly shown that the common and perhaps dominant form of high remnants pseudo single domain grains is the single vortex domain state. Typical single vortex domain states are shown here on the right, and the expected grain size range in which they nucleate is shown on the left. So we can see that the grain size range for single vortex domain states in equidimensional magnetite is about 2000 nanometers or so, maybe a little larger, compared to about just 40 nanometers for single domain grains. Of course, single domain grain size range will increase with grain elongation, but then the single vortex size range also will increase with elongation as well. So perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised that in our natural samples, which will have a range of grain sizes, that the single vortex or the PSD domain states appear to dominate. Uh, the fact that pseudosingle domain grains dominate a paleomagnetic sample, of course, shouldn't be a problem for us because it is not the domain state that's the important thing, but rather the ability of the domain state to retain a reliable paleomagnetic recording. And as we see here in the figure from Les's 2017 paper, single vortex grains are predicted to have paleomagnetic stabilities that often exceed that of the single domain grains and so should indeed be excellent paleomagnetic recorders. With that in mind, uh, what I'm going to do is, to, uh, what we'd like to know, sorry, is to, is whether the single vortex domain states predicted from the micromagnetic models, if they do indeed plot within the pseudo single domain range where most of our experimental samples sit or if there is a different day plot trend that emerges from our numerical models. So we have used our open source um, modeling code Merrill to simulate the hysteresis properties of magnetite particles for grain sizes from 45 nanometers up to 200 nanometers in idealized grain shapes of truncated uh, cube octahedrons with both um, prolate and oblate morphologies as shown in the center panel here. We then calculated the hysteresis loops along 30 uh, Fibonacci directions, so 30 directions distributed over the sphere, as well as calculating the backfield minor loops needed to determine the cursivity of remnants. The results from our models are shown on this diagram. Each model particle is plotted as a circle or square whose size is proportional to the size of the grain. And it has been pointed out to me that it's difficult to distinguish here, uh, which I realize. Um, and each point is colored according to the grain axial ratio that's shown in the legend. Um, also to distinguish their different characteristics, prolate grains are plotted as circles and oblates as squares. Yeah. What is immediately obvious is that small grains are in the uniform single domain state and have MRS values that reflect their magnetic anisotropy. So for magnetite, the highest value of um, MRS is for cubic anisotropy and having a value of uh, 0.866. Then uh, oblate grains with a fourfold planar anisotropy will have an MRS value of uh, 0.71. And the finally, our uniaxial grains of the lowest MRS value of 0.5. 
and get this to work right. Uh, so any grains with an MRS value of less than 0.5 cannot be in a single domain state. We see that most single vortex grains do indeed plot in the PSD region of the Dave diagram with grains of increasing axial ratio, moving the points towards the left and upper part of the plot and uh, grains of increasing size plotting towards the right and lower region of the plot. What is particularly uh, noticeable is that oblate grains, which are still highly stable paleomagnetic carriers, plot well into the multi-domain region. And the reason for this is that such grains have relatively small vortex cores that reduce their remnants value, so they have lower values of MRS, whilst their high uh, polar plane symmetry yields lower coercivities leading to high HCR over HC ratios. Overall in this log log day plot, there is a linear trend then of paleomagnetic stability that lies diagonally across the diagram from the top left to the lower right. It's worth comparing our study on idealized grain geometries with that of uh, Evan Nicholson, and I think uh, Richard, you're a co-author on that paper, who produced similar model day plot parameters from irregular grain geometries observed uh, from uh, an igneous intrusion. And most of the grains they observed are triaxial in shape, and most have a single vortex domain state. So they're realistic grain structures, and the overall trend from these irregular grains is in fact very similar to that we see in our idealized grains. So we think using these idealized shapes is not so severe an approximation. We can also compare our models with those of experimental observations in sized powders shown here by the stars. And here we're only going to plot samples whose medium size corresponds to the size ranges that we've modeled. So that's up to about 200 nanometers. And again, these experimental data in sized um, uh, magnetite powders or uh, laboratory grown samples agree, agree well with our numerical models. We can also uh, look at how our models compare to experimental observations in larger grains. So here I'm gonna show a short little movie that lasts a few seconds, where I gradually increase the maximum grain size of the experimental data that is plotted. And you can see that for grains above about three or four microns, uh, which will increasingly be dominated by the multi-domain grains, true multi-domain grains, they plot well below the single vortex stability trend, even for oblate grains. Some have argued that the ratio of the coercivity of remnants to coercivity is misleading with some very high values associated with particular types of anisotropy, as we saw from our high, um, highly oblate grains. Uh, and so have suggested that it's better to use an AL plot of MRS against HC seen here on the left, or probably uh, better still MRS against um, coercivity of remnants shown on the right. And um, while these do appear to give a better domain state diagnostic, using the absolute values of coercivities or absolute values of coercivity of remnants means that uh, this analysis is tied to specific minerals. Um, so you need to be very careful when applying this to real paleomagnetic samples. We've so, uh, that's a very short talk, but in conclusion, I think uh, what we've seen is that the day plot can often provide a very useful indicator of paleomagnetic stability. I know that to some this may appear a very um, uh, controversial or is that we're, we're uh, kind of flogging a dead horse and we should be past this uh, plotting of simple parameters. But I think it, it still remains, uh, a, if you're going to measure one or two parameters in your paleomagnetic laboratory, plotting them in a day plot is a prerequisite really to identify samples that have some semblance of having uh, remnants carriers that are stable, uh, stable over many millions of years. So we have observed that on some very high HCR or HC values, which are associated with vortex uh, states in highly oblate grains and triaxial grains, uh, but those in fact 
well, at least from my perspective, don't appear to be very common in most paleomagnetic samples. Uh, and true mother domain states, I think, generally plot well below this stability trend indicated by our models. So the conclusion is that we suggest, despite the many pitfalls, which of course I've glossed over, that uh, whilst the day plot uh, might not reveal exact domain states in real samples with wide distributions of grains, it does remain a simple and useful indicator of stable, uh, stable paleomagnetic recorders. And that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Wynn. I, I have lots to say, but I will. <laughs> I, you don't, I don't see any foam around the mouth, so I, I feel fine. Not frothing. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Yeah, Connor. I, I was going to say we could ask Wynn to ask himself a question. But, um, <laughs> uh, one of the criticisms, and it's one I found with that people in on the day thought, is that. Uh, when it was originally designed, it was effectively designed for magnetizing. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the, what's your view on people plotting um, polymineralic samples onto a day plot? To plotting what? Sorry, I didn't quite hear. Uh, if, you, if you have samples where you think you have multiple magnetic minerals phases, yeah. and I've seen lots of people just dump everything, all the measurements on there, even though in the text they will say, oh, I've got green eyes, I've got sulfur, I've got magnetite, I've got everything in there. Yeah. Well, I think um, one of the points that I made is that uh, what are you looking for in your paleomagnetic samples? You want something with a high remnants, right? High signal, uh, high, uh, that, that's something that's going to carry a, a strong paleomagnetic uh, signal. And you want it to be stable. So you're looking for it to be pseudo single domain or, or uh, single domain and not have. Um, not have too low a coercivity. So for almost every uh, mineral that you can imagine, good paleomagnetic carriers are going to plot vaguely in that PSD region. So I think for most, for many grains, they will, many mineralogies, I'm sorry, they'll plot in there. If you're looking at, uh, I, I know Lisa's uh, talks is 2002 paper, and I've seen more recent papers, I think by, um, uh, uh, people have looked at, say, uh, um, hematite, and uh, you can get cases where you get uh, very high saturation remnants, but even then, uh, for those multi domain hematites, you get HCR over HC values, which are exceedingly high, again, associated with the kind of basal plane anisotropy. So I think. Um, you know, people have to use a day plot or forks or whatever other characteristic that people are using to identify assemblages of minerals and grains. You have to use it with some common sense. There isn't one parameter that says, yes, this is stable, this is unstable. And we all know as paleomagnetists that even if your sample passes every rock magnetic test that you pass, that you that you subject it to, and it comes out as ideal, you still get paleo intensities that make no sense. So uh, I think, uh, to my mind, uh, I think this even for samples that contain a range of mineralogies uh, and uh, distributions, wide distributions of grain sizes, this is still a good indicator that if you have samples that plot in that PSD region, you must have a significant fraction of grains in there which will carry a stable remnants. You mentioned the, the ones that plot the oblate single yeah. plots ones. I mean, you think, I mean, those should be still very stable remnants carriers, right? Indeed, yeah. So, but uh, did you say at one point that stability increased or decreased from uh, upper left to lower right? I suppose? Yeah, so you can see, oh, I'm not showing my screen anymore. I don't know if you have my, uh, should I share my screen? Let me go back to uh, that. Yeah. yeah, so these, uh, can you see my cursor? Maybe not that enough. Anyway, these uh, these blue uh, squares yeah. that uh, are highly oblate, that's true. They do. Uh, 
so that is a confusing factor, I agree. So if you you can have multi-domain grains that plot in that region, true multi-domains, I would say, if you plot true multi-domains on that diagram, they will fall, they will have MRS values even lower than that. So, you know, they're going to be up, uh, lower than 0 0.01. So I think uh, you, you're right, there is, a, there is a confusion there. Uh, but I think these highly oblate grains probably are relatively rare. And so I wouldn't, you know, my, my argument is why throw the baby out with the bathwater? It's still, if, you, if you're going to do a quick and simple diagnostic test, and not every laboratory has a nice uh, VSM that they can measure lots of forks with, that uh, this is still a useful indicator of, of remnants. And, well, it isn't directly a, a comparison between fork analyses and, and simple history system day plots. But, you know, as we've seen in some um, presentations today, if you go to the bother of, of um, generating a fork diagram, the majority of paleomagnetists will simply use it to identify a single or a range of coercivities, which I'm not really showing is getting you very much further than the, the day plot. I'm not an evangelist necessarily for a day plot or for the fork diagram, but I think. Uh, yes. I mean, if you, I guess my one, it does my one last point. I think, can you flip back to the one where you showed the Nicolaisen data? Oh, no. Yeah, sorry, I'll show again. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I guess the one thing that really struck me about that study is that, that all of those points from that Nicolaisen study are from particles within a single like 10 micron size volume extracted from a fit. So you have the yeah. entire range of, of behaviors within the day plot represented within that one tiny 10 micron volume. Uh, yeah use the date plot they're not using it in that way they're using it to represent the average value of their sample which is all of the grain size distribution the multi mineralic distribution so that one point all those mm -hmm. points there collapse onto a single point which is the average for that sample which is almost entirely dependent on the, 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 the grain size distribution it didn't tell you anything about yeah. distribution. i guess that's why you know well, i would disagree with you because if you average those points still have, you know, stable remnants counts. I guess that is the point. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, collapsing these points will generally result in a value that's that's in this upper, uh, the, the triangle, I guess, the, the, on the upper upper right, which is the, so uh, you're right. I, I mean, the, the exactly where you put these, uh, the, these vertical and horizontal lines that, that uh, uh, Day, uh, Day et al. And, and David Dunlop have also um, used with different values. Of course, that doesn't, you know, it's, it, that, that's not particularly uh, rigid and it's hard to justify any particular value. And yes, you could get rid of those. But if you had, if you had paleomagnetic samples, which plotted, uh, you know, in this region here, then you, you would seriously have to worry that uh, you had any any significant quantities of reliable signal carriers. Whereas if they plotted up in this sector, then I think you would conclude that you yes, you must have some. So I don't think it depends how you use it, right? You don't want to use it to, to say yes, I've got twenty percent of single domain and thirty percent of PSD, and I've got a few multi domains. I think it's as, as a broad indicator of whether your sample is worth putting into your uh, magnetometer for another day in order to measure the paleo intensity sample. I think that's basically it. And if you spent a day prior to that creating a fork diagram, what else is that information generally would most paleo get out of that? They would simply take a range. Most of them would be looking at, um, is there a range of coercivities in there that indicates some sta stability? And 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 I, guess I so. think that's a useful thing. Exactly. Uh, might, it's, it's, it's just the olivine where the, the, they all plot in that lower right diagram, the lower right of the day plot, but the four diagrams show the same the, behavior. So you see the lower left. I, I'm confusing my left. this area. Well they plot they plot in the MD end. 
Yeah. Uh, below this. Yeah, they put way down there. But they, yeah. Because they. Uh, but, but do you think that might be because they're interacting? No, it's because it's iron, not magnetite. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole different story. But if, but okay. if MAS values of less than 0 0.01, which hold a stable relevance. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> New vortices, right? Anyway, anyway, <laughs> thanks, Wayne. We shall okay, continue. No <laughs> Thank you.